Once an artist starts working on something, energy concentrates around、mm. that that creative work, and ideas begin to come. And you might have started out, you know, thinking I'm I'm just going to write a song, or I'm just going to write a short story,、yeah. and the next thing you know, you've got an album. Steven, thank you so so much for being here for taking the time. I am a very long time fan, so this is an extra special treat today. Uh, it's my pleasure, Mary. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I, of course, originally found you as we talked about in Instagram、um, years ago when my husband and I were first starting our photography business, even. And I read The War of Art, and I have since recommended it to everybody that I know, basically because we all struggle with the resistance. And we're going to get into that in the second part of the episode. Um, but you're here today because there's a brand new book that we need to talk about first, which is A Man at Arms, that is releasing very soon. When when is the actual launch date?、Uh, it actually was a week ago. Last Tuesday it came out. Out、yeah. in the world already.、Yeah. Amazing. Tuesday Amazing. the second, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So everybody listening, you want to get your hands on this. A Man at Arms is. A fiction book. It is not、uh, a nonfiction book, the way the War of Art is. And、um, I want you to kind of talk about right off the bat in both the War of Art and A Man at Arms, you have the same quote within them, which is, "It is one thing to study war and another to live the warrior's life." And this is from Telamon of Arcadia. What does that mean? What is that difference between studying war and living the warrior's life? Um, I think it's sort of the difference, in a way, between being an amateur and a professional,、mm. but on a but on a deeper level, in in my mind,、um, uh, it is one thing to talk about a photography business, or to you know plan it, or to lay it out, or to, or a podcasting、mm. adventure, or or a book, or anything like. That. But it's another thing to be actually living it,、yeah. you know, every minute of the day. And、um, so the character of Telamon, who says this in the War of Art, that's sort of it's in, in many ways that's his kind of I don't want to say his、uh, his slogan, but it's 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 his real his point of view of life, and、mm. he's the central character in the fiction book, A Man at Arms, and he he lives that that、uh, that code.、Yeah. That's he's a man with a code, and that's his code.、Yeah. And I feel like I am living by the same code, and I bet that you are too, Mary.、Mm. Yeah, you know what? This is this is a very random analogy, Stephen. So bear with me. But I heard this this thing once that said something about like,、um, you know, when you think about like eggs and bacon for breakfast, it's the difference between. The chicken、oh. and the pig, right? It's like the chicken was involved, but the pig like really had some skin. Yeah, in the right. Game、uh, that's a great、thing. analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah.、Um, so I want to talk about. Let's first, just for everybody listening, let's kind of lay out what the plot, the synopsis is for Man at War. It's taking place a few years after Jesus's crucifixion.、Uh, Rome is occupying Jerusalem, the the whole province, really, and there is a letter on the move from Paul.、Wow. To the people at Corinth, and it says in particular, what's in the letter could bring down an empire. And we have our guy, our man at arms, and he's been hired to stop the message. So, to kind of talk a little bit about where the idea for this came, what you know it stands for, like is it is it metaphor for something bigger?、Um, talk a little bit about just like the whole general、uh, plot. Well, you did a great job, Mary, in、okay. <laughs> laying that out.、Okay. Um, the、uh, I'll go back to a little、uh, deeper than that.、Uh, I、um, my niece got married a couple、mm. of years ago,、okay. and she asked me to be the officiant at the at the wedding. And actually, my brother had secretly married them, <laughs> but then、mm. I was going to be the one that did the、uh, the public version of it. Got it. So, in coming together with whatever I wanted to say, I went to the Book of Common Prayer,、mm. and I found that the things that I was pulling out, the quotes I was pulling out. All came from Paul's 
from First Corinthians. Mm. You know, love suffereth long and is kind. You know, uh, for now we see through a glass darkly. And when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And so that was kind of in my mind that that letter that I thought was really about. It was about love. Mm. I mean, he used the word charity. You could use the Greek word agape, mm -hmm. but it was you know a sort of a transcendent love. And then, uh, you know, as a writer, you're always looking for some devices that will make a story really pop. Mm. And I just thought, what if we could do kind of an adventure story mm. around the delivery of this letter yeah. that the Romans are trying to stop at all costs mm. because the, this new faith is a threat to the empire? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this, my character of Telamon of Arcadia, who's kind of the one man killing machine of the ancient world. Mm. And is also a, a man who has a code, but has no real faith. Yeah. You know, he's really a, 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 in, he's a, he's a pure warrior. Mm. And I thought if I could involve him in somehow in this, with this letter trying to, and, and, uh, that that might make a great story. Yeah. And then there's also, as you know, there's a young girl that's mm -hmm. involved in this that he becomes involved with and that, uh, you know, a nine-year-old mute girl mm -hmm. who has, I won't say anymore, but has something to do with the letter. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where the story came from. Yeah. The, the, that's sort of the inciting incident that kicks it all off. Would you say, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is like they got to read the book to find out, but is that kind of like what was driving you is this idea that uh, when there are empires in the modern world, when there are instruments of oppression in the modern world, that the way that you topple those is with love, is with charity, with, with agape? Uh, I mean, my, you know, when I write a book, mm -hmm. I, was just, I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday about this. I... My computer screen is right in front of me, and I put a little post-it on that that's of, a, of the theme. Mm. And um, so I can refer back to it if I get lost. And what I wrote for this was fear with a little arrow pointing to love. Fear, arrow, love. And so that was the whole um, guiding principle of this, of this story mm. and every character that was in it. Yeah. And I think Paul's letter is really about that. It's entirely about that. Mm. So in very early in the book, I think even when they're still standing in the inn before the narrows, um, there's a line, what could a man alone accomplish? What could a man alone accomplish? Um, I mean, you know, people of faith would say a lot. You know, the, this character, we would say a lot. One person sending a message, one person delivering a message, we would say a lot. But unfortunately, and fortunately, our hero is flawed, as the best heroes are, right? So Telamon starts off driven by riches. He wants to get paid. He's not doing it, as you said, for faith. He's not doing. He's not even really doing it for his code at this point. He agrees to deliver the message or to to find the person who's trying to deliver the message both to save his own skin and to get paid. And so let's talk about that because we are all these flawed characters. And and a lot of us, I think, feel like what can one person alone accomplish in the world, in a world when things are dark, in a world where there's fear, what can one person accomplish when we think about bringing love? Uh, well, obviously, if uh, we can certainly think of a lot of people who are individuals, male and female, who have changed the world. Mm. Um and so I do think, you know, one man, one woman can accomplish anything, you know, mm. can accomplish strategies. Um, in terms of of Telemann and his story, you know, when in any story that you're writing, you always want the hero to go through a huge change yeah. from A to Z, right? Otherwise, there's, there's no real story. Mm. So um, that was why I wanted him to start out as a kind of an amoral character yeah. that is just doing it for the job, just mm. doing this for money, and then to go through a, a process of change as he encounters the various other individuals who are also one person changing the world Yeah, that, that he encounters along the way. Yeah. You know, um, I was thinking about Telemann and I was thinking about what you just said about like this A to Z conversion and what's motivating him at the beginning of the book versus what's motivating him by the end. And I did a podcast episode with the author Ian Morgan Cron. I don't know if you know who he is. He wrote uh, The Road Back to You. And mid-episode, I've mentioned this a 
for longtime listeners, you've heard me tell this story before because uh, I, I am still thinking about it. He was talking about how for most of us, our lives, the first half of our lives are the parable of the talents where we're trying to figure out how to go out and make a profit with our specific skill sets and gifts. Ah. And the second half is the parable of the prodigal son where we're just trying to find our way back home. Ah, I had never heard that before. I like that. Me either. And I burst into tears when he said it because I thought it was so beautiful. And it, it, I think for a lot of us, it feels like if we didn't grow up with a lot, we go out in the world and we try to make the good life. And then we realize that still doesn't feel, fill the hole and we're trying to find <laughs> our way back home. For when you think about Telamon, um, you, you know, we see these glimmers that even if he's like motivated by getting paid or he's not doing it out of just duty or to, you know, help the, the, the train passage go through the narrows, um, we see these glimmers of him as, a, as I, I wrote down a servant leader. So I'm thinking specifically of in the inn, he offers the little girl the drinking water first. And then we see him do that again with the apprentice David. So when you were writing him, did you see him as was, was servant leader a part of it? Was that like some of his redeeming qualities? What did that mean to you? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a great question, Mary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, actually, to be honest, I never even thought about that. Yeah. But I am, uh, I'm a, I'm an absolute believer in that. I don't know if you're familiar with a book of mine called The Legend of Bag of Vance. Yes, yeah. Which is absolutely about, uh, you know, it comes from the, the Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. and where Krishna, i.e., God in human form, is a servant. Mm -hmm. You know, much like Jesus, right? He mm -hmm. is a man of sorrows, or or uh, he's a charioteer for yeah. the great warrior Arjuna. Mm. And uh, so I never had thought about that with Telamon, but I definitely meant him to be, to have glimmers all the way through. Yeah. That uh, this hard shell on the top was not really who he, who he really was. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think that's true in most stories. You know, you remember the movie Casablanca with mm -hmm. Humphrey Bogart and yeah. Ingrid Bergman? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, of course. You know? Like through the whole movie, he's this hard bitten guy, right? Who says, I stick my neck out for nobody and that kind of thing. Yeah. But yet there are glimmers of his character mm. where you see that he is a good guy. And in the past, he has been on the on the right side of things. Mm. So that when he does become a good guy at the end, it's not a complete surprise. Right. <laughs> not completely unbelievable. Yeah. Do you feel like that's like just from the purely practical writing side, do you feel like that's necessary to keep the reader invested in him even if he's just I, not, I do yeah I do you know yeah. there's a there's a I don't know if you've ever uh there's a book about screenwriting called save the cat have you ever no. heard of this? that it's, sounds awesome it's really good it's by a guy named Blake Snyder and um one of his um premises or his maxims is that the, the hero of any story, very early in a story, male or female, mm. should have a little bit of a scene where they, quote unquote, save the cat, where they do something nice for somebody. Mm. And uh, there's another saying of uh, about that where if you see, if you meet the hero for the first time and a dog comes up to him and he pets the dog, he's a good guy. If he kicks the dog, he's a bad guy. Yeah. So, and if you actually, if you watch movies or you read books, and look for that moment. It'll mm. be there in almost any in any movie or book, in a, in a, in a maybe in a subtle way. Yeah. But there'll be a moment at the start, because usually the hero. I don't know if I'm getting in too. No, this deep is awesome. I love here. it. I love it. A lot of times, a hero, like uh, let's say a Clint Eastwood character in in a western, is a hard bitten, mm. you know, embittered person at the start, and. You, you as the writer are, and the audience is thinking, am I supposed to like this guy or not? I don't like him. He's like a killer or whatever. Mm. But there always will be a moment when they'll show like a, a sensitive side or they'll reach out to someone that's vulnerable. Yeah. And yeah, so definitely, I very definitely did that. That yeah. scene with the water cooler, that was definitely all about that. Mm, interesting. I love that. And I think that Casablanca... Um, analogy or example is really good too, because he is very like, I'm not going to help people. I'm not going to help people trying to, you know, not get captured from the Germans, I guess it was like, I'm going to, you know, I don't want to get arrested trying to help other people. Like I, I'm, I'm out for me. And that's Telemann in the beginning. He's like, I get paid. I expect to get paid. You get paid too. Um, I want to talk in a way, Mary, if I can interrupt for a second, in yeah. a way, 
that's all of us mm. in our in our lives, right? You were talking about, yeah. you know, the first half of life and the second half of life. And in fact, uh, you must be familiar with Richard Rohr's mm-hmm. writing, yeah. Falling Upward, which is sort of a similar thing, right? A first half of life mm. where we're kind of creating the vessel of our identity, our job, our marriage, our children, whatever. Yeah. And then in the second half of life, we ask the question, what do we put in this vessel? Or what do we do with this wow. this, this identity that we've created? That's good. The vessel of life and what do we put in it? That's really good. That's really good. Um, David, our apprentice character, um, there are a few things that I notice about him right off the bat. And, um, one of them is he takes particular, um, shame in the fact that he can't read or write. And he directly equates that to, I will then never be a a big man of faith. I will never be somebody who is lofty. Um, like the Sudachis, is that how you say that? Say that again. The who were the lofty people in the book? The there was the Pharisees who were slightly less lofty. Oh, the Sadducees, you mean? Is yes, that what you mean? that's it. That's it. Sadducees. Uh, yeah. um, and and what's interesting is that David in the story is existing post Jesus. He's existing after Jesus came and intentionally spoke through parables, so that if people didn't read or write, they could still have access to the faith. So do you feel like he the message just hadn't spread to David yet? Or like, I just think what's so interesting about that is there are people listening right now who think they will never be truly on the inside of faith or Christian circles or whatever you want to call it because they can't spout scriptures on demand. Ah. So talk a little bit about that. Like what, what role is David playing in terms of having access to this post-Jesus world? Ah. Well, I definitely wanted, it was very important that he not be able to read and write mm-hmm. because the um, the religion at the time and Jerusalem Judaism at the time was definitely, and still today, is a religion of the book, right? It's a very, mm-hmm. it's a very literal thing where you study, you need to read. And, and, um, and I think that in kind of projecting myself back into time in my imagination, mm-hmm. that I um, uh, that uh, Jesus's teachings were looked down upon mm-hmm. as that they were for the people of the street who couldn't read. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, so I very much wanted to have David. David is actually the most religious character, or most spiritual character in the book, other mm-hmm. than maybe Michael, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was important for me that uh, that he have that aspiration that he felt he couldn't live up to. Yeah. And then in the end, of course, he does live up to it. Mm. There's I also... give away too much here. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also um, this part of David's storyline where he has an abusive earthly father and he begins following Telamon, says, You're, you'll be my dad now, you'll be my father now, to which Telamon says, no, I won't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, not interested in that yet. Not, you know, not that person yet. Um, and then he feels... He, he has this view of God. So in my book, Dirt, I talk about being 12 and feeling like there's this indifferent God who had his favorites and we weren't it, who had the mm-hmm. families he wanted to bless and we weren't mm-hmm. it. And he was this cold, distant, indifferent God. And I feel like that's David at, at the beginning of the story where he's like, why would I go really lean into following this God who won't even remove Rome from the city like he could in an instant? He's, he's supposed to love these people so much. Where is he? And he's equating how he feels about his earthly dad with this heavenly father. And I think so many people can relate to that. So just talk a little bit about that for, for David's character to struggle with how he sees God because of how the people in his life have treated him. Ah, you know, it's funny, Mary. I hadn't thought until you said that. I hadn't thought about that either. Yeah. As far as, it just was sort of instinctive for me that uh, I, I felt that... Uh, David's point of view was he couldn't believe in in a higher realm, mm. a, a more spiritual realm, because nothing seemed to come from that realm to help yeah. in in the troubles that that were in the world. So the reason why he was drawn to Telamon, the warrior, mm. was that the warrior was here in this world, even though his yeah. his primary tool was violence, you know, and self sufficiency. 
he at least was in this world. And again, like I was saying, a character wants to go from A to Z, right? So I wanted David to really change. Yeah. I wanted him to go from that point of view of, I sort of like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, now that I think about it, of I only believe in this live, this material world, and I want to learn to 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 act in this world alone. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of the story, he is into a whole other different world. Yeah. And, and he turns out to be the one who teaches Telamon. It's not the other way around. Hmm. Yeah, I'm giving away too much of the story, but <laughs> no, that's, that's the good. way things work in stories. Yeah, that's yeah. good, though. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Rome. And you had, you know, you're sort of setting up, like, how did this city on the Tiber, Tiber, uh, Tiber, bring the whole world into subjection? And you said, here is how a Roman was given orders and he obeyed them. And you begin to talk about the assimilation Rome is trying to bring throughout the world, and that one of their methods was to create these highways, not just for the fortunes and the prosperity that they would bring, but because they brought mail. And that mail connected these people who had been very isolated to this outside world and to all these possibilities, because mail brought information. And you say... Rome's motives were entirely self-interested. The conquerors believed their highways and waterways and the trade and postal communications that sped along them would bind their subject peoples in such shackles of order and dependence upon their overlords as would render these submissive, compliant, and incapable of rebellion. Yet as with any world-altering innovation, consequences unintended and unforeseen soon ascended to the fore. And the place where my brain immediately went, which may be like, is just, you know, what I was seeing in it, is when you think about innovations that are world-altering and have unintended consequences, I immediately went to the internet and social media. And, you know, in this really ironic kind of twist the availability of information, the availability of connectedness to the outside world kind of only has that ability for dangerous ideas to spread up to a certain point before the method itself gets in the way with noise and misinformation. So I wanted to kind of break that apart a little bit of, did you think about that at all? Were you thinking about modern innovations that have unintended consequences in terms of that? Uh, I I wasn't. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, you know, it was all about Paul's letter. Yeah. That that was the mail. Mm. And that Rome kind of made the mail available yeah. where it wasn't really available before. And that that was the seed mm. of its own destruction. Yeah. But, yeah. They So um, they intended it as a tool of captivity and it yes. became a method of freedom. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I think the internet is today is doing the opposite where people hoped it would be connecting yeah. and bringing people together. And in fact, it seems to be driving people apart. Mm, yeah. So I don't know, maybe there's some new revelation coming, but it, I don't, it hasn't come yet. I don't think. That's right. That's right. So when Severus talks about, he's talking about his frustration with the, the citizens, the, the Jews in, in the city, he says, this banquet of blessings Rome sets before you and all we ask is peace. Yet still you hate us. And he goes on, for all our differences, mercenary, talking to Telamon, you and I have one thing in common. We live in this world. These Jews and Messianics do not. They abide in the next world and may be reasoned with no more than a shade or phantasm. So tell me more about that. Do you feel like this divide between people who believe in something beyond this world and bigger than this world inherently can't find peace with people who are of this world? Well, there certainly, certainly seems to be a, a chasm there. Mm-hmm. I mean, Rome's, Rome, to me, was all about order, mm-hmm. right? They were a, an imperial nation that conquered other nations and then yeah. subjugated them, you know, deliberately. And one of their, their methods was, it's really kind of like America in a way, mm-hmm. was to bring modern um, uh, transformations like roads, they built harbors, they built aqueducts. Yeah, that was a huge thing with Rome that would bring water from you know hundreds of miles away, and really would um, transform a landscape in in a good way, mm-hmm. bring prosperity, bring trade, and stuff like that. But and their aim, of course, was to subjugate the to make the people depend upon them. But 
what happens, I think it's more, I don't know if it's as much spiritual as it is sort of tribal or nationalistic, that nobody likes to be under another nation's thumb, Mm. right? And even the blessings that are brought, the material blessings that are that are brought, the the subjugated nation will get a, rid of them in a minute, and trade them for freedom. Mm. Uh, and certainly, of course, in in Judea at the time, where the nation of Israel was very much uh, people of the book, very mm. much people of of. Uh, uh, of, of, of spirituality, of a whole religious look, vision of the world. They didn't care about yeah. these blessings that Rome was bringing them. They, they were in, they wanted to study. They wanted to, you know, um, follow their own, their own uh, autonomy. Yeah. Do you take an opinion on, um, like, would you hope that the reader of the book would see the merit of being somebody with their eyes on something beyond this world in resisting the temptations of prosperity, resisting the temptations of prosperity is offered, but it's really a shackle. It's really oppression. Like, what are you hoping that the reader walks away from in terms of that message? Uh, I think that's exactly the message that I'm, that I'm hoping to give. It's really, uh, you know, if there is, if there is a message mm. and, um, you know, the, I don't want to give too much away here, yeah. but the character of Telamon, even though he's like a, a, a great warrior and a man of, uh, of um, self-autonomy and stuff like that, mm. has no money and kind of lives, even though he fights only for money, he winds up giving it all away mm. because he's living by, uh, even though he's struggling toward it, he's living by a code that goes beyond that, even though he couldn't articulate it until, say, maybe the end of the book. Mm. So, yeah, very much that was a method or a message that I was trying to yeah. get across. Do you have any, like, um, words of wisdom or something you would want to <laughs> speak specifically to the person who feels like, you know, I'm interested in this God person, this God guy, um, I do not, I'm not super interested in the religion, like the people who are feeling like, God, yes, circles of Christians, maybe not. And there, or, or even just the person who's like, but I'm a good person. Like I'm living by a code. So like this difference between code and faith, if you had to break that down uh, in terms of just what, what that does in your heart, what that does with your life, like code versus faith, what would you want people to know? Um, let me answer it in a slightly different way. Okay. I would say the difference is between ego or mm. rationality and soul. Mm. And I think that um, our real life is lived on the soul level. Yeah. Um, which you could also equate to the unconscious, mm. you know, to the source of the dreams that communicate to us or inspiration, intuition that we have. And I think when organized religion goes wrong is when they lose touch with that. Yeah. And, and I also, I'm, I'm a believer for myself that it's more of an individual experience. I know it's communal. I know people love to gather in churches and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I know that that's important. Mm-hmm. But in my own experience, um, I'm in my own life trying to communicate, to follow my own soul, my own deeper level. As a writer, I'm trying to follow the muse. I'm trying to follow the goddess that brings me along from one project to the next. Mm. And so I'm not sure if that's an answer, Mary. Yeah, no, it is. That's that's a perfect answer. And I think it transitions really well into let's talk about the war of arts, which is this idea of muse and, and writing from your subconscious and, and that, that part of your brain that's making connections that you never would have thought to make, but suddenly as you're facing the blinking cursor, they start tying together. Um, let's talk about, for anybody who's not read the, the War of Art, which you should absolutely do, just explain to us who who is the resistance. Does the resistance in your head when you picture it, is it a person? Is it a creature? Is it anything physical or it's just a force? Uh-huh. Well, let me sort of describe the War of Art is really about, it's a short book mm. and it's really about the inner war mm. that 
the artist or the creative person or the entrepreneur or anybody that's aspiring to move from a lower level to a higher level. Yeah. Um, it's about this force that I call resistance with a capital R. Yeah. That's an entirely negative force. That's like the devil, if you want to make it. And, and it is that force which arises whenever we have a dream mm. to go to a higher level, whatever that may be, to write a book, to make a movie, to have a podcast, to do a photography business, to, to rebuild a, a park in the local, whatever it is. Mm. Whenever we have a dream, immediately an interior force, a diabolical force of self-sabotage arises yeah and it, it takes the form of a voice in our head that will tell us we're not worthy of doing this we're too old we're too young we're too fat we're too skinny mm. the, the the idea we've had has been done a million times before much better etc cetera, etc cetera. and it also takes the form of fear mm. we become terrified of it of self-doubt that we're not worthy of doing it and it takes the form in our in our actions of procrastination we'll put it off yeah. distraction we'll take we'll go off on other uh, avenues detours dead ends and we won't do the work mm. or it'll take the form of excessive perfectionism we won't do it until we're absolutely able to do it hundred and then yeah. we don't do it at all that's right so um, the war in our head is the war against that force, that that negative force. And mm -hmm. nobody ever told, teaches us in school. Nobody ever told me about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I encountered it when it sabotaged me from writing and from doing the things I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so that's my sort of my foundational concept of what, what the war of art is about. Yeah. And um, one of the things you talk about with the resistance is that you know, it loves drama. It loves to stir up drama. Um, but also just that it is very particularly for, for a force that's trying to disrupt creative, it itself is not that creative. Like it has its, <laughs> its favorite loops that it kind of plays through. So for people who are yeah. listening and they're like, oh, that sounds like what I might be up against. Like what are, in your experience with like people who are trying to do something, you said, especially if it's going to help people, you're really in trouble. What are like some most, you mentioned a bunch of them, but are, is there like one that comes out the most commonly as like, yep, resistance. I know it without a doubt that's resistance. Is it <laughs> procrastination or which one's the most common? Procrastination is probably the biggest one yeah. for most people, you know, yeah. you, because, and I think the reason is that we, we can rationalize it. We can say, mm -hmm. I'm not giving up on my dream. Mm. I'm just going to do it tomorrow. Yeah. And so that's a real easy way to, to go for it. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in Jewish mysticism, mm. there is the concept that, um, that we exist on the material plane and above us, the higher, the nobler plane, the soul, the neshama, is trying to communicate to us and mm. help us while we're trying to communicate to it like in in a prayer would be a way of communicating it for yeah. a writer or an artist. It would be like, you know, what's my next idea? You know, give me. And that in this in Jewish mysticism in Kabbalistic mysticism, there's a force in between hmm. that's trying to block the, the communication. And it's called the Yetzer Hara. Okay. And uh, my rabbi, Rabbi Finley, hmm. uh, told me when we were talking about this, he says, the Yetzer Hara is what you would call resistance, Steve. Hmm. So, in other words, uh, I'm not the only one that experiences this or the thought of it. This is definitely um, a, a true force that we all have to deal with. Yeah. And that just nobody teaches you about it. Yeah, you know what I think is fascinating when you were describing that? It reminds me of, in Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, she is talking about... Um, there's the muse and then there's the little boy. It's a little boy in her story. And she said that like they're at peace, they're playing together. And every so often in her story, she talks about they will pass up the paper dolls. They're in the basement and it's just her job to get it down on paper. It's just her job to transcribe. And when I was writing my book for whatever reason, and I don't know why, and I didn't have a reason, but in my head they were in the attic and they were passing uh -huh. it down. Uh -huh. uh, it was little me and it was God, and they were hanging out up there at peace. They were playing, and occasionally they would pass things down, and it was my job just to get them on the, in the Word document. And so that gave me, like, chills when you were talking about this plane just above us trying, uh, yeah, to, just trying yeah. to talk to uh, us. That's, yeah. 
That's crazy. Um, yeah. What is like, what is the, what's the opposite of resistance? What's if resistance is trying to, you know, is there another force fighting on our behalf or is it just us against resistance? I think absolutely. There's another force fighting on our behalf. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, uh, um, I don't know what, what the name of it is. I don't know what name I would give it, mm-hmm. but there's Persistence, a, maybe. <laughs> Persistence. There's that, there's that famous quote from Goethe where he says, um, beginning has a magic to it. Mm. Anything that you can dream or, or think that you can do, begin it right away. Mm. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. It's like once we commit to something, I'm sure that you've had this experience, Mary, in your business and your podcast, whatever, yeah. that once we commit to something, forces come into our life. Mm-hmm. And not just airy fairy forces, but real forces like people appear who have money who could f- help us, you know, or yeah. or people with wisdom will give us advice or something like that. Yeah. And very definitely, um, once once an artist starts working on something, energy concentrates around mm. that that creative work, and ideas begin to come. And you might have started out, you know, thinking, um, I'm just going to write a song or I'm just going to write a short story. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you've got an album or you, you've got an entire novel or something like that. Yeah. So very definitely there's a, I mean, I consider it the muse. I consider it the goddess or the Greek goddess that that comes and brings inspiration and brings ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, but very definitely there is a force. And I think that force, the positive force comes first. Resistance is like the shadow that is cast hmm. by that that dream, that positive dream. Yeah. Wow. You know, I mean, of course, like I would be comparing these two as I was preparing for the episode and I'm thinking of the War of Art, which I've read, and I'm thinking of the Man at Arms, which I've, you know, I'm about uh, a little over a third of the way through and it's incredible and gripping and it reads like... Wait till you get two thirds of the way through. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, and so for me, an interesting parallel that I started to wonder, and maybe this one fold as I get into the second, third is like, you know, I'm thinking is Telemon our creative, our, our writer, our author, our painter, our podcaster, whatever it is. And he is, um, he's got gifts. He's got certain skills. He begins from this lower plane of, I will do it to get money. And then he starts to ascend to I mean, I'm going to do this for a bigger reason. I'm going to be transformed. And the resistance, I was like, is the resistance them venturing into the desert? Is the resistance them venturing into all the danger that lies there? Like, I was really just trying to think through, um, you know, our stories. There's like the guides that come along to help us, the people who end up teaching us when we yeah, we're yeah. going to teach them. I feel like there's a lot of like overlap there. So what would you say if you had to pick? And I know you probably didn't think of it this way, but what what would the resistance be embodied as in a man at arms. I mean, in pretty much any story, any novel or any movie, mm. the resistance is is the vi- are the villains. Yeah. You know, are the physical villains. It's a metaphor for the internal thing. Like, and in Telemann's case, it's the Romans, mm-hmm. and then there's a whole bunch of other people that are that evolved, that are trying to stop him. Bandits and and all all kinds of other people are trying to stop what he's trying to do, so that. The metaphor, he, he, he responds with physical violence, mm-hmm. right, to go against them. And also he runs away from them, tries to escape them, tries mm-hmm. to evade them, tries to outwit them. Yeah. But for us, you know, the, the villain is, is, is here. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. an internal fight. So that really the, the two books are kind of the same, A War of Art and A Man at Arms. One is exterior and one is interior. Mm. Yeah. You know what's interesting? And I just had this thought even as you were talking <laughs> is what's fascinating about this whole adventure and this whole journey and this whole like action, like you said, like a story of action, is that Paul, who wrote this, these words that could change lives, that could help set people free, he wrote the words and then he sent them off. And he in this story, he's, he's over here, he's written the words, you know, he's hanging out in prison or wherever he is at that point. And there are these people who come along and it becomes their job to help 
get the message out there more. Like words that you've written, you know, as as I'm telling my all of my coaching people, you yeah, gotta read this yeah. book or what have you, words that I've written as we have our launch team or whoever sharing the book, they're the in a, in a weird way, it comes back to what you were saying about do the beginning and the energy will come. Do the beginning and the universe will open up to you. Like they're these messengers and these people who will defend the message will come alongside you. Yes, yeah. it's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, there's a thing in uh, in the War of Art. It's a quote from, um, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but it's, the book is The Scottish Himalayan Expedition. And it's about... You know, these guys in Scotland that decided they were going to climb, not Mount Everest, but something else. Yeah. And they had uh, no money, no connections. And when they started with the dream, again, connections, people came to their aid. Yeah. Unexpected things happened. They got free steamship passage. They, people helped them. Mm. And there is something about, it's just true in our real life. Yeah. That when, once we start something, aid comes to us, not just in our in our minds, in our hearts, but in but in real life. Mm. But to go back to flashback just to Paul for a second, if you want to think about him, think about his mm. own odyssey mm. where he originally started persecuting yeah. the followers of Jesus mm. and then became the foremost after his conversion, yeah. the foremost proselytizer and really the man without whom, you know, Nothing might have happened. Mm, mm. He came out of sort of out of nowhere, but not really because on the soul level, things are happening, you know? Yeah. Below yeah. the surface. Love that. Love that. Well, Stephen, this has been amazing. Let everybody know where they can get their hands on this brand new book as well as The War of Art. But where can they get this book, both of these books, in their hands? Uh, they're uh, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. And um, my website which is just my name, stephenpressfield.com, mm -hmm. has got all kinds of information about about that yeah. stuff. But you can get it every, get them both everywhere. Awesome. And then on Instagram, what's your handle? Uh, it's just my name with a, a what do you call it, a, a dash in between it, underscore, underscore yeah. Stephen underscore Pressfield. Yeah. Perfect. All right, friends, the book is A Man at Arms. It is out everywhere now. Books are sold. You can find it on Amazon, local bookstores, Barnes & Noble. Get a copy in your hands. Grab both books, The War of Art and A Man at Arms. Read them together because I feel like, just like Stephen said, one is on the inside and it's a mental game. The other's on the outside. Read them together. If you are anybody who wants to write a book, start a business, put any kind of art out into the world that's going to help people, you're going to want this in your corner, especially on the resistance. So go check that out. But now make sure you keep the conversation going with us as Stephen and I hop over to the new YouTube channel where I get to ask him one more question, a bonus piece of content not found here in the episode. <laughs> so you're going to want to go check that out. And until next time, friends, this is the Mary Morant Show. Mary Morant Show.